In this video, I'm going to give you a probably overly detailed overview of my trip to Las Vegas that includes a side trip to Hoover Dam. I'm going to share with you why I took the trip, how I planned and booked the trip, getting there, the hotel and check-in, my experience on the southern half of the Las Vegas Strip at night, my experience on the southern half of the Las Vegas Strip during the daylight, my Super Bowl Sunday bet, my experience on the northern half of the Las Vegas Strip at night, the trip to Hoover Dam, downtown Las Vegas, why I cut the trip short, returning home, what I think of Las Vegas, budget and expenses, and what I learned. So if those first few chapters where I'm just talking about planning and booking the trip are kind of boring, then feel free to skip around to different chapters. Let's start with why I took the trip. I recently got a new job which gave me a rare two week gap where I had both free time and discretionary funds at the same time, so I figured, why not take just the second vacation I've ever had? The first one was Paris 2016 for the three of you who care, which should be half of the people who will watch this video. Anyway. Taking a domestic trip was on my 2022 bucket list, and I felt like taking a road trip, which is actually my first solo road trip out of state. I've also never been to Las Vegas as an adult. The last time I had been there was in May 2000 when some elder family members wanted to look at houses, and I recall it being about 115 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and something like 90 or 95 degrees at night. It was absolutely brutal. Other trips I considered were LA, but I didn't want to be there during the Super Bowl, and the Pacific Northwest, but that seemed like too much driving. Now let's see how someone who almost never takes a vacation plans and books this type of vacation, which I'll admit I basically did the night before I left. Let's start with the car. I got a one week rental scheduled from Saturday, February 12th to Saturday, February 19th. I ended up with this Mazda CX-30 that's probably either a 2021 or 2022, but I'm not sure. I'm also not sure this would have been my first choice to rent, but I didn't care enough to ask for something different. Anyway, the estimated cost was $365.68. As for the hotel, I believe I simply googled hotels on the strip that had three nights available from Saturday, February 12th through Monday, February 14th. And I just clicked on whatever looked like the best value. The best looking value was an Expedia result showing Treasure Island, TI Hotel and Casino, a Radisson Hotel, Las Vegas. I don't know what this price breakdown means, but it looks like Saturday night was expensive, Sunday night was free, and Monday night was... reasonable? I also had to look up what a resort fee was afterwards, which apparently is just an extra charge hotels throw in to get you that isn't even included in the main charge. Now that the hotel and car are booked, let's get there. I left the rental car location in San Francisco around 12.30 p.m., which meant that I would probably arrive in Las Vegas after 9 p.m. For those of you who've never driven from San Francisco to Las Vegas, it's about 8.5 hours give or take 30 minutes depending on traffic and weather conditions. The unofficial halfway point is Bakersfield, California. Once you exit the Bay Area, the rest of the first half of the trip is all Central Valley. Then you head into the Tehachapi Mountains, and when you arrive on the other side you're greeted with the Mojave Desert that dominates much of the western United States. So it's nothing but desert the rest of the way to Las Vegas. The state line is this little town called Prim, Nevada, and about half an hour later you'll start noticing some city lights. As you enter Las Vegas you'll pass by some landmarks like Allegiant Stadium on the left and the Strip on the right. And for the zero of you who are curious, the rental car used a tank and a half of gas to get there, which came out to around $90. Now we've entered the finding the hotel and checking in chapter. You don't realize how much of a premium parking in San Francisco is until you visit other cities that allow you to just drive into the parking structure without bleeding you for every hour your car sits there. The parking structure had this view of this trip, so I knew I probably chose the right hotel. However, finding the hotel section of the casino is tricky if you've never been there because the wayfinding isn't so clear. To check in, there's a room with kiosks you use to find your reservation in their system and it will spit out your hotel keys. I eventually found my hotel room, so here's a really bad tour. Okay, there's the room, and there's the bathroom. That's it. Okay, I'll take you. There is Raymond. Um, there is the toilet, there's the tub and the shower, um, 
There's a mirror with Raymond in it. Bed, bed. Um, TV that's not probably going to get any use. Another mirror with Raymond in it. And the view outside. You can see. Okay, I'm not even really sure what to do now that I've gotten here. I guess I'll wash the sunscreen off my face. Then it was time to hit the strip. I suppose I should tell you what the Las Vegas Strip actually is in case someone living under a rock decided this video would be her or his first activity after crawling out from under that rock. The Las Vegas Strip is a stretch of Las Vegas Boulevard that's actually outside of the city limits of Las Vegas, fun fact, and it's known for its concentration of resort hotels, casinos, entertainment, and neon lights at night. It's one of the hottest tourist destinations in the world, and sources seem to agree that it's the stretch of Las Vegas Boulevard that's roughly between Sahara Avenue and Russell Road. I disagree with that, at least where they claim the northern edge begins. I believe the northern edge begins around Fashion Show Drive, which you'll see later in the video. Anyway, that first night I decided to walk the southern half of the strip, which is actually most of the strip as I alluded to a moment ago. Starting at my hotel, Treasure Island, I was already technically in the middle of the strip. From Treasure Island, you could see Palazzo right across the street. You'll also get a view of the strip with the Venetian, Harrah's, and the Mirage in the foreground with Caesar's Palace and the Cosmopolitan in the distance. Walk a little south and you'll pass the Siegfried and Roy monument. Walk a bit farther and you'll see the Mirage with its waterfall fountain and digital ads on the side of the buildings. Casino Royale is right across the street from the Mirage. If you're a shy introvert like myself, this atmosphere can take a little getting used to. After the Mirage, you'll reach Caesar's Palace with its waterfall fountain and Greek-inspired sculptures. Near Caesar's Palace, you'll see a couple of celebrity restaurants. Gordon Ramsay's Hell's Kitchen. The dough is raw. Yeah, chef. And Giada De Laurentiis's restaurant in the Cromwell Hotel across the street. Here you'll also see the Flamingo across the street from Caesar's Palace, and you'll see Bally's and the Eiffel Tower replica in the distance. Walking farther down Las Vegas Boulevard past Flamingo Road, you'll reach Bellagio Hotel and Casino and Bellagio Fountain, where you may catch a water show like I did. Here at the Bellagio Fountain, you get a better view of Paris, Las Vegas. As you head toward the intersection of Las Vegas Boulevard and Park Avenue, you'll reach what I call Consumer Central. Not that the rest of Vegas isn't just a giant consumer playground. It's just that this area has many of the brands you'd see in or near your local mall, but Vegas says it will be more fun if you consume those brands here because we put your favorite brands in bright lights. Here you'll see places like Outback Steakhouse, Marshalls, a Coca-Cola store, an M&M store, a Hershey store, and a Pepsi store, because of course Coke and Pepsi aren't going to allow the other to have the only soda store on the strip. As you approach the corner of Tropicana Avenue, you'll reach New York New York Hotel and Casino with its roller coaster and Statue of Liberty replica. So, is this entire replica skyline just one giant hotel and casino? Because that's impressive. Anyway, across Tropicana Avenue is a castle replica called Excalibur Hotel and Casino. Keep going and you'll see Luxor in the foreground and Mandalay Bay in the distance. Luxor Hotel and Casino is the pyramid with an Egyptian theme. I don't believe Mandalay Bay has a special theme since I vaguely recall reading that it was one of the first major hotels built on this trip, but here's what it looks like. In between Luxor and Mandalay Bay is Mandalay Bay Road, which I turned onto to walk across the freeway toward Allegiant Stadium, the fairly new home of the Las Vegas Raiders. Ironically, as I approached the stadium it reminded me of the Raiders former home the Oakland Coliseum because of the way the stadium and parking lot sit right next to the freeway. At least aesthetically, the stadium isn't bad. Whatever material was used to reflect the city lights off of the facade was a nice design touch. 
After walking back across the freeway past Mandalay Bay Road, I headed to the famous Las Vegas welcome sign, which admittedly is a farther walk down Las Vegas Boulevard than it looks on the map. Like everywhere else in this city, not surprisingly, there will be others at this spot for the same reason you are. I turned around and headed back north, and when I got to Tropicana Avenue, I crossed over from the west side of Las Vegas Boulevard to the east side where MGM Grand sits. From MGM, you get a better view of New York, New York across the street. I encourage visitors to walk on both sides of Las Vegas Boulevard to not miss anything. For example, I missed the Pepsi store when I was on the other side of the street. Anyway, here are more name brands lit up in Vegas style. In Las Vegas, Walgreens and CVS stores are of course open 24-7, something I wish we had here in San Francisco, but there are way too many thefts, which is why it seems like every week a Walgreens here in San Francisco closes. Anyway, that was my first night. I don't remember eating dinner in Vegas that night, so I don't have any food to show you. I believe I was still full from a Carl's Jr. burger I ate on the drive. Super Bowl Sunday arrived and the winter weather was... sunny and in the upper 60s Fahrenheit. I got to do some daytime exploration of the strip, which I apologize for not visually documenting very well. Here is me riding the moving walkway at the Venetian Hotel. Here's the Candy Park at Fashion Show Mall with the Wynn Resort across the street. And here's some painted steps at Fashion Show Mall. As for the big game, I found a bookie and bet $200 on the Bengals to win. These ladies, who I'm guessing work at the Flamingo, half-jokingly said I meet their height requirement, and they were of course happy to hear about my bet. The hotel I stayed at had a Popeyes in the casino, so that's where I watched the beginning of the Super Bowl while taking the opportunity to see if the Popeyes chicken sandwich lives up to its height. It does, though keep in mind I ordered it without mayo. As previously mentioned, the weather was good, so I headed back to the strip in search of dessert. Not desert, though there was plenty of that. Dessert. Because apparently the main goal of crafting the English language is to make it as hard as possible for non-English speakers to learn the language. Anyway, before showing you where I got dessert, this is what the outside of Treasure Island Hotel and Casino looks like, which of course is pirate ship themed. And here's an area in front of Caesar's Palace where people like to take pictures. Getting back on track, I went into a mall called Miracle Mile Shops where I tried some cookies from this Nestle Toll House Cafe. They're not for me and they made me want Mrs. Fields cookies, but you won't find a Mrs. Fields near the strip, unfortunately. I headed back to the hotel to watch the rest of the game which included a legendary halftime performance and legitimate hope of a decent payout. Then the last two minutes of the game happened and I watched my $200 melt away. Now, if I would have chosen the Bengals to simply cover the spread, I would have won some money because the spread was 4.5 points and the Bengals lost by just 3 points. But correctly choosing the underdog to cover the spread isn't as high of a payout as correctly choosing the underdog to win the game outright, so I went with the higher risk, higher reward bet. After a cookie induced food coma nap that I hoped would wipe my memory of the final two rounds of the NFL postseason, I decided to walk the northern half of the strip. As I alluded to earlier, the northern half of the strip feels more deserted than the southern half of the strip because the north side has more undeveloped lots. After passing Fashion Show Mall, there's a long walk past an underdeveloped lot before reaching the Las Vegas Hilton. Then there's another smaller lot and a McDonald's to walk past before reaching Circus Circus, which kind of makes Circus Circus feel a bit detached from the strip. However, I couldn't help but sit there and admire the sort of fever dream of neon light soaking my poor shy brain with overstimulation. The secluded nature of Circus Circus sitting in a lot away from the rest of the strip almost adds to the ominous desperation of its flashy mascot asking me to walk into his casino. Come on Raymond, get in the van. I mean, the casino. Continuing north on Las Vegas Boulevard, the Sky Tower Condominiums and the Hilton Grand Vacations Club are next after Circus Circus. I apparently did not document either of those, so we'll move on to the Strat Hotel, Casino, and Skypad. 
which at 1,149 feet or 350 meters, is apparently the tallest freestanding observation tower in the United States. Other than Circus Circus and the Strat, the northern half of the strip doesn't offer much so there's a lot of empty walking. I turned around at Sahara Avenue near this kind of creepy looking strip mall. On the southern quadrant of that corner you'll see Sahara Las Vegas. Walking back on the other side of the street I encountered construction zones and empty lots so I'm going to fast forward to the takeout dinner I grabbed from Grand Lux Cafe at the Venetian. The food was decent, almost good enough to make up for the moderately long wait, but I was at least glad to be in a city that actually offers passable food options at 1am. Valentine's Day in Las Vegas. And just like every previous February 14th in my life, Valentine's Day would play no significant role on this day. The significance of this day came from the mini trip I planned to a landmark I'd yet to visit. Hoover Dam. To get to Hoover Dam from Las Vegas, you'll take I-15 to I-215 to I-11. I'm thankful to live in the age of digital technology because Google Maps directed me off the freeway to get around a traffic accident. Anyway, once you're on I-11, you'll drive through 20 or 30 miles of desert and take off exit 2. Then head under the freeway to Hoover Dam Access Road, which will take you to Hoover Dam Visitor Center where the parking structure is. It costs $10 to park. From there, it's a less than 5 minute walk to the dam. The first thing I notice is how high it is. Of course. I'll admit I was a little unnerved by the groups of people walking by behind as I stood on the edge. It doesn't help that it's also kind of breezy up there, so just be prepared for that if you visit. When you're on the dam, you can see the Mike O'Callaghan Pat Tillman Bridge over the Colorado River. I walked across Hoover Dam from the Nevada side to the Arizona side and used the opposite side of the street to walk back so I could see what was on the other side of the dam. The other side is Lake Mead, which apparently is the largest reservoir in the United States by water capacity. This is where the extra water that the dam saves from flowing down the Colorado River is stored. I'm going to guess that this stored water is one of the reasons that desert cities like Las Vegas are even possible, thus explaining the relatively close proximity of Las Vegas to this dam. You can also see some concrete towers. One tower shows Arizona time, which is American Mountain time, and the other tower shows Nevada time, which is American Pacific time. I returned to the car and drove a couple minutes up to the Boulder Dam Bridge parking lot. Parking was free and there were plenty of spaces, but keep in mind I came on a Monday, so your experience might be different if you go on a weekend. So I walked up to the Michael Callaghan, Pat Tillman Bridge and halfway across. I should warn aspiring visitors that this bridge is not for the faint of heart. When it comes to heights, the dam is just a warm up. In fact, you saw what the bridge looked like from the dam. When you're on the bridge, it's a long way down and the bridge even has a warning sign telling you to explore at your own risk. And of course it's even windier up there than it is on the dam, the walkway feels like it slopes down away from the road, and the bridge shakes whenever a large vehicle drives by. But the bridge gives you the best scenic views of Hoover Dam, so it's up to you to calculate your risk. After leaving Hoover Dam I headed back to Vegas and went to Fremont Street in downtown Las Vegas. This was first suggested by my mom via text, and then later suggested by the Flamingo ladies the day before. I found parking in the downtown Grand Parking Garage. I think I paid $8 for 52 minutes or something like that while I was there, so the parking isn't expensive. The Fremont Street experience is basically an indoor-outdoor mall with live music, casinos, shopping, restaurants, a large digital ceiling with animations, and a zip line. The Fremont Street experience is the section between Main Street and Las Vegas Boulevard. East of Las Vegas Boulevard is a more traditional old town looking area about two to three blocks long. After my nearly hour long walk through downtown I returned to my hotel room to work out. Because I'm the type to work out on vacation. 
One of the things I love about only using resistance bands for my workouts is that I can bring them anywhere without needing a gym membership, and they're easy to pack. I used all the walking I did during the trip to justify not going for my usual pre-workout run, but I was still guilty enough to add an extra set to each lift, so there's that. I have no images of dinner to show because I got takeout from a Denny's. I plan to get my post-workout meal from Outback Steakhouse, but the greeter told me that they only do dine-in and not takeout, which goes against my high-life philosophy of eating in my hotel bed. In search of other steakhouses, I found that they do do takeout, but all of the steaks are around $100 a piece, and I was still hurting from that Bengals bet. So I got steak and eggs from Denny's. The eggs were fine, but the steak was one of the worst I ever had, so I regret not splurging on one of those $100 steakhouse meals. It was now Tuesday morning, which was the day I was supposed to check out of the Las Vegas hotel and embark on the second half of the trip. I had two ideas for the second leg. Either go to the Grand Canyon and Horseshoe Bend in Arizona followed by the Arches near Moab in Utah, or head to LA for the second half of the trip. But I spent a little bit too much money in Las Vegas and was exhausted after three days, which is about my th vacation threshold. Thankfully, Hoover Dam satisfied my need to get out and see other desert destinations. I'm not sure why I felt the need to add this returning home chapter since it's basically just the getting there chapter in reverse. I believe I left Las Vegas around 11 a.m. and got back to San Francisco at 7.45 p.m. So what do I think of Las Vegas? I'll say I can understand why people visit. I always wondered what people can do in Vegas that they can't do in their nearest major city. And as suspected, the truth is that Vegas really doesn't have any one thing unique to it. It's just that Las Vegas is more of a vibe than anything else. I'm someone who goes places to sightsee and capture images I can show off on social media, and thankfully the strip had plenty of that in my first visit so I didn't need to force myself to indulge in more traditional Vegas fun to get any fulfillment from the trip. This section is for you if you care how much this 3 day trip cost. I budgeted $2400. Despite the estimated 1 week cost for the car rental being $365.68, I was charged just $291.85. Probably because I brought it back on Wednesday, February 16th instead of its Saturday, February 19th due date. Gas cost a whopping $222.10. Outside of the rare occasion when I need to rent a car, I don't drive, so I can go months or even years without driving. But I now understand why those I know who regularly drive also regularly complain about gas prices. The Mazda CX-30 I rented had a tank that held about $60 worth of gas. And the trip took about a tank and a half each way, so the round trip was in the $180 range. The $222 total comes from me having to refill the tank before returning the car. The hotel cost $530.08 for three nights from Saturday, February 12th to Monday, February 14th with a Tuesday morning checkout. As mentioned in the How I Planned and Booked the Trip chapter, I booked through Expedia. If you've never booked through Expedia, I should note that doing so will initially show a double charge on your card, one from Expedia and a slightly higher one from the hotel, but don't worry because the hotel one will eventually get reduced down to the difference between the hotel charge and the Expedia charge. And again, here's that weird nightly price breakdown I showed earlier. I spent $167.67 on food, which admittedly was mostly just chocolate and cheeseburgers. I put that I spent $200 on gambling, which was just my losing Super Bowl bet. I spent $18 on parking, which includes the $10 at Hoover Dam and $8 in downtown Las Vegas. And the $42.40 miscellaneous expense is top secret. I'm just kidding. The $42 is the suggested tip plus tax the flamingo ladies asked when taking a picture with you. They asked for $20 per model, which might seem a little steep for most people, but I'm a former model, so I'm probably more sympathetic to their profession than most other visitors. The total expenses came out to $1,472.10, which would have left me with just $927.90 to spend if I went through with the second half of the trip. So I decided to return home and pocket the savings. Things I Learned it's probably better to fly an hour or so than it is to drive eight and a half hours. 
Paris and Las Vegas are the only two vacations I've ever taken, but they both confirm that my vacation threshold is three days before I'm over it and want to return home. The third thing is that if you want to stay in a hotel that actually feels like it's on the strip, stay in a hotel south of Fashion Show Drive. Ignore search results that say the strip goes all the way up to Sahara Avenue. But I understand there are economic reasons for Vegas wanting people to believe the strip actually goes that far north. I lucked out with Treasure Island and would probably stay there again if I returned to Vegas. I'm sure I could keep adding things here, but this video is already quite long, and I need to thank you for watching and sharing, and I need to end this.